Hi, and welcome to the first of a two-part series, because we're covering it over two weeks, on the phylum Mollusca, the mollusks. This include the common things you may have seen, like clams and snails and octopuses and squids. And um, they have a rich fossil record that goes back to some of the early, um, definitely the earliest fossilized animals, like in the Cambrian and probably even into the Ediacaran period before that. Um, over time, we see a major shift in mollusks. For one thing, there's one group that swim. This is like including the cephalopods, at least most of the cephalopods. They're their own dudes. They're swimming, they're eating, probably eating their own babies. We can get to that later. Um, but the other ones, the ones that are living on the bottom, uh, change from ones that are kind of more sessile, more hanging out in one area, we see in kind of the Cambrian. And then starting in kind of the late Cambrian and, and then throughout the rest of the Phanerozoic, we see more active predator mollusks. We don't think of snails as active predators, but if you're being eaten by a snail, it's an active predator. They may move slow, but they're still active. Same thing with clams. Clams can actually move around quite a bit. And in general, in the fossil record, active predators that go out and, and, and just chow down on other things, they tend to be uh, much more common after the Permian extinction. So the Triassic, Jurassic, all the way through to the recent, which is why when you walk on a beach nowadays, frankly, if you walked on a beach going back to the Triassic, you would find lots of broken shells of clams and snails. Um, we, we, and so when you, if you want to think about them, then mollusks, at least the, the, the ones that are on the ground, not the swimming ones, are great for doing environmental interpretations. And we'll get more to that later with the specific groups. Um, as far as telling time with fossils, clams and snails are really good for the Mesozoic and Cenozoic. And then in times of the Paleozoic, uh, certain intervals are pretty good, but in general, they're not as common as the things that are sessile benthic filter feeders that we'll talk more about uh, in a later week. Um, however, the cephalopods, the swimming guys, they are great for telling time all the way back to the Devonian. And, and there's some good ones in the Ordovician. But certainly when you hit the Devonian and you move onward and, and definitely all through the Mesozoic, um, one of the key fossils to find in order to date a rock is a cephalopod, an aminoid. Now, a lot of different critters I just said in the first couple minutes there. So we have like clams and snails, octopus, squids, even weird guys. Well, not weird to me, but but things that aren't as common, these tusk shells or scaphopods, these uh, chitons that you find on the beach that have lots of different uh, inner tidal zones, lots of different shells. How are they all connected? Well, they are all connected through the ham, the hypothetical ancestral mollusk. Now, what is the hypothetical ancestral mollusk? It's basically, you can imagine taking all the mollusks we know that are really different looking when you look at them, but then say, what do they have in common and break them down to their most common shared features and then create an animal because there's not one that really exists. That's why it's the hypothetical ancestral mollusk. And from there, you can then build all these different mollusk groups. That's what I want to do today is show you all the different mollusk groups built out of the ham the hypothetical ancestral mollusk. So to start with, let's um, one thing about all mollusks, people like to eat mollusks and animals like to eat mollusks because they're basically just big pads of meat in a shell. And so they're really, really juicy. There's lots of stuff there. And so all mollusks have a pretty thick body that we, we say is covered by the mantle. And I should say now, I'm not going to go through every little tiny part. There's loads of resources out there. I'm just trying to get the basics so that you feel comfortable. And then you can go to the books and the interwebs and get that extra information. So all mollusks share a pretty meaty body. And most of them are encased in some kind of a hard part. Now, is it a shell? Well, it is now. But probably with that ancestral mollusk going way, way back into that earliest Cambrian, or maybe even the late pre-Cambrian, it was probably its shell learned to mineralize, or I shouldn't say its shell, its body learned to mineralize lots of tiny little bits, kind of like little mini building bricks. And we know from modern mollusks, most of the shells are made out of calcite. A lot of them use aragonite, and then some use some other kind of a nacreous material like vanadite, but calcium carbonate shells. So let's look a little more deep at this, at this ham, this hypothetical ancestral mollusk. All right, so what I've done is I've taken this ham and I've added a few extra parts. I've taken that body or that mantle and folded it in on both ends. At the front end of this, we can now have a mouth. These dudes are animals, right? 
so they can eat food, process it in the stomach, probably have some other digestive stuff going on. And then it's got an exit route. You know what I'm talking about? And that goes to another kind of fold in the, um, in the body wall. And that's also where the gills are typically found. And because this is an active animal, breathing oxygen, doing lots of things, there's going to be blood moving around. There's going to be other kinds of organs in there, including gonads to make babies. Anyways, that's just all tucked inside of this meat packet. And then one thing mollusks share is that one edge of that meat packet, that body, becomes a modified foot. And so I wrote foot. And in our hypothetical ancestral mollusk, that foot is just sort of attached to the substrate. So... The mantle with the foot, the mouth, gut, anus, the gills, the other organs, and some kind of a covering, that's your basic ham. So what do we want to build first? Let's build the mollusk that's most like the ham, the monoplocophorans. All right, so monoplocophorans are the easiest ones. It's the same deal. We just kind of turned it into a shell. And we find monoplocophorin, which means one shell, all the way back into the Cambrian, and we still find them around today. Now, let's make it a little more complicated because you can imagine someone saying like, well, that was the easy mall. Let's make it harder. You're like, fine. You want me to make it harder? I'll make it harder. I'm going to take that shell and I'm going to break it up into many shells. How's that for getting more creative? Well, and since we took that one shell and made many shells, we create the subgroup, the polyplocophorins. And the common uh, polyplocophorin you may see walking on a coastline is a chitin. So a chitin is a modern polyplocophorin. Okay, that's one way to do it. How about another way? I know, uh, let's see. How about if we take that shell and we fold it over the critter and and uh, make, a, make a two shell situation? All right, by taking that shell and making two shells and folding it over the body uh, with the foot coming out the bottom, you've now created all the clams and oysters. Those are the bivalves. Now, old textbooks say uh, the term... Um, uh, Pelesipoda, which means hatchet foot. Don't use pelesipods for bivalves. It makes you look like you don't know what's going on. Call them bivalvia. And, and if we want to really do it the way that most clams do, and this is where we start to modify that ham, is let's take that foot and turn it into two siphons for moving water around so it can suck in uh, water, breathe, it can get organics, and it can expel things. Not my best drawing, but there you go. There's the two tubes, and which is why we will often find clams in the sand or the mud. They're upside down with that siphon sticking up so they can breathe while underwater because they're an animal. Okay, let's see. Let's do another one. I've got an idea. Let's make a tube. Okay, this next group is the scaphopods, or they're commonly called the tusk shells. Interesting group. Um, really hard to see in nature because they're they're found in the sediment, usually in the deep sea. And so we, we don't find them as common actually in the modern, unless you're dredging maybe the seabed, as you do find in the fossil record. So they're still a little enigmatic about how they eat and live. Um, I've, I've got one right here, in fact. These are some uh, fossil scaphopods. These are giant ones. Most of the ones that I see are like the size of like little toothpicks. Uh, these actually came from a methane seep deposit in the Paleocene. And so I suppose they really were like this because the pointy part's up on top. It's just easier to hold the other way. And uh, it's been bugging me for a number of years why these guys are so big. Was it something to do with the methane seeps? Well, we could talk about that later if you're interested. But Scaphopod, our next smallest group. Now, drawing the next smallest group is hard. And I don't know exactly how to do this well. So I'm just going to have to talk about it. Imagine if you took that body, that ham that has its mouth, gut, anus, gills, and you took it and you folded it in half. But at the same time you're folding it in half, you're twisting it 180 degrees. Pretty weird. But there's this whole group of mollusks. They're pretty common. And they all have their body twisted 180 degrees and folded over on themselves and they're called the gastropods yeah i didn't try to draw that whole torsion thing but another major group of the of the mollusks that's the gastropods that includes the modern snails and slugs and even some shells that maybe look like clams because they're kind of flat but what they really are is they're a gastropod whose shell spun so quickly that it um it looked like one piece and so these include uh, modern abalone, which are actually a kind of a gastropod. 
Okay, then the last group is, uh, let's go back to kind of taking that hypothetical ancestral mollusk, and just to make it easier to draw, we'll turn it on its side, and we'll do some crazy stuff with that foot, and then add some pretty nice organs, you'll see. All right, I got to do this in stages. So I first took that body, and I turned it 90 degrees, so the foot is sticking out here. Now let's take that foot and turn it into a bunch of tentacles. All right, so here's our one example of our cephalopod. It's an octopus. And if you learn one thing today, plural of octopus is not octopi. It's octopuses because it's a Greek word. Mull that one over. So we've got our octopus with its lovely eyes that Heather always told me like octopuses have like really amazing eyes. But squids, we have ammonites, we have all these other things. How do we do that? Well, we drop that shell. Let's go put the shell back on it. Well, we could put the shell inside it and that makes it into a squid. Well, let's make it on the outside. Now we've created something like a nautiloid or an ammonite. And as that animal got bigger and bigger and bigger, it just kept building more and more chambers. So the fossil would, would look like a bunch of chambers. And if we want to make it kind of fun, well, we could spin that whole guy up into a big old uh, Danish. And there we go. Now, in reality, uh, the major groups of cephalopods are a little more complicated in how they're related. But in terms of this overarching introduction to at least the major groups of mollusks that we find in the rock record, uh, there you go. Hopefully what you got out of this is you can see how they're all built out of this one ancestral mollusk. Now, for our lab this week, uh, for the, the Chico State uh, Invertebrate Paleontology, we're going to focus on kind of all of these groups except the cephalopods. And so we'll bring them back next week. But you're going to want to be there because we're going to see some crazy guys like this amazing one that I collected in Morocco a couple years ago. This is called a goniotite. It's a monster, but I love it. All right, so let's uh, focus on these different groups. Um, there's actually not a lot more to say from here, except the scaphopods are simple. Polypocophorans, which include the modern chitons, all have some of those in my class, so people here will see those. Monopocophorans. Let's talk about these bivalves and gastropods. So let me go through some of the key things to get through about those. All right, so focusing on the bivalves, which are clams and oysters and their friends, gastropods, things like snails and slugs, um, really long fossil record going all the way back to the Cambrian. Uh, and again, certain times you might find a lot of them. There's a period I know when I've collected in the early Ordovician. Well, I didn't collect in the early Ordovician. I collected rocks of early Ordovician or lower Ordovician age. Anyway, sometimes you can find giant beds of snails. Same thing in the Devonian. There's not, a, but, but they tend to volumetrically as a geologist, you don't find a lot. Once you cross the Permian extinction, you go into the Triassic, Jurassic, Cretaceous, start to see loads, loads more of clams and snails. And then even past the Cretaceous extinction, going all the way up into the uh, Quaternary. So really dominate the modern environments. And what I want to use this YouTube time for is to kind of just go over the major parts of the shell so that when the folks come into class and they're looking at them, they've had some experience. And um, yeah, and then there you go. And it's hands on. And I'm going to really focus. I'm not I'm not a biologist and I'm not a bivalve or gastropod biologist. I'm a geologist. And so but I use fossils. So this lecture is going to be focused on what does a geologist like what parts of the shell should you know so that. If you describe it well, you might be able to date the rock or understand the environment or get some information you could pass off to other people. As I'm going to think in my head every single week on this, there is so much to talk about. I have good friends in Poland that work on um, snails and clams that are associated with methane seeps. And my God, we just have the most amazing time talking about ecology and symbiosis and who's living where and when did the snails that are actually more active carnivores evolve? And, and why do you find clams in the Silurian that look like ones that should be in the modern? There is so much to talk about. If you want to talk about it, hit me up and we'll talk about it. But for now, we're just going to kind of boringly go over the shells for this YouTube video. And my voice got slower and deeper because I'm sad to just talk about that. All right, I'm going to cover all clams with one picture. There are obviously a lot of variations. And that's the thing to think about with evolution is why there might be variations. And, um, and, and yeah, 
and, and what that would relate to time or environment or sexual dimorphism, all these various things. Okay, so let's start. This upper one here, that's looking at the outside of a clam, and it's the right shell. This is looking at the inside. And many clams have growth lines on them. I'm not going to write that. We'll have the little magic come up on the screen here. But we see growth lines. And then there's typically the tip of the shell. That's the umbo. Here I've got one. It's a left valve, but what the heck? Uh, it's reversed. And so here you can see growth lines coming around. And this is the tip, the umbo. Now, when we flip this one around, what we can see are this part of the umbo on the inside is really thick. Okay. That's what I tried to draw right there at that pointy thing. <laughs> and uh, some of the schmutz off of there. And then right inside there, uh, we see these teeth and sockets because the um, shells are held together with, the, with grooves of teeth and sockets. Teeth and sockets. And then here's what I look for as a geologist. There's um, muscles that hold the shells together. Clams naturally want to be open because of the ligament on the back of the shell. I guess this would be like that. Um, that's why on the beach, you often find them splayed out and they look like butterflies. But in reality, yes, they want to open up. And so the muscles are holding the shell together. And those adductor muscles, where they attach the shell, they leave scars. And so there's one scar right here. And there's another scar right here under my foot, my, my foot, my finger. And so here I drew on the board, like one thing to look on the inside of a shell are these muscle scars. Now, this line here, that goes around, yeah. that's where the body attached the shell. And that's known as the pallial line. And what's here's something that I really dig about clams is that pallial line often comes in on the shell or doesn't, or it comes straight around. If it comes in, we call that the pallial sinus. Now, when I drew on the board before, the clams had a foot, and then they've got the two tubes sticking out. Oh gosh, let me just read them, sir. And so we see there's like the foot sticking out of the of the really the front end, and then there's the the two siphons that are breathing the water coming out of actually the back end. We flip that around, and so those siphons come out of the post. The siphons come out of the posterior, and the little bit of foot's the anterior. Well, it's kind of like a garage. The paleo sinus is the garage. If you make a dent in your shell, so you have a lot of space, then you can have a really long tube to come in. If you just have a little garage, then you're just gonna have little tiny tubes that stick out. So just finding the shell will let you know that something was able to go deep into the sediment, have a long snorkel, or probably didn't go deep in the sediment because it had a short snorkel. To me, those are the major features that really vary between all of the bivalves. All right, not my best snail, but it'll work. Okay, snails coiled up things. Unlike the ammonites that we'll see later though, they, the, the, it's hollow all the way through. So the critter can get the little sluggy thing and get all the way up in there. Um, could be a really simple ornamentation. It could be a really complicated ornament with all kinds of spines and growth lines and things like that. That's how we tell them apart by their outer shell. But what really unites the snails is they have this opening where the body comes out. And sometimes snails on their on their bottom of their feet, they can have another hard calcified because it's made of calcium carbonate, like a lid or a door that can close that. And it's called the operculum. And so sometimes we find an operculum. It's rare in the fossil record, but at least in the, you find them. And then, um, because they tend to be really thick actually. So they actually preserve well. Um, as this trap door to the shell. So now we see the closed door, the operculum on the shell. Each of those uh, uh, spirals around are called the whorl, and the body is connected in the body whorl. We talk about the top of the shell as having the apex of the shell. And um, the operculum here uh, fits into the opening at the base of the shell. And if you don't want to say opening, say aperture. It's the aperture of the shell. Here's the cool thing to think about uh, as a geologist collecting it. 
snails start out as little babies. And as they get older and bigger and bigger, they keep expanding the shell. The shell differentiates. That's why, even though it's a cartoon, I started to draw spines and growth lines. And particularly around that aperture, you see lots of details. There's other features we'll learn about in class, like the siphonal canal and the umbilicus when you break open a shell. The bottom line is, if you found a fossil, try to get the last bits, even a broken bit of that aperture in that last bit of the shell is going to tell you a whole lot more than a well-preserved little bit of the apex or the top of the shell because so many snails look the same. Think about humans, right? As babies, we kind of look the same. But then as we get older, we start to differentiate and we can tell each other apart. So clams and snails both go to that outer part of the shell if you're going to collect pieces. I think that's probably enough to talk about this week. So I hope you enjoy it. And uh, we'll see you next week for the other mollusks, the cephalopods.